1935, a college friend and I decided we want to come to Mexico. We heard it was an interesting country, of course. Yeah. So we bought an old Ford for $75, mm -hmm. Model A, and we started out for Mexico. We crossed the border at Laredo, mm -hmm. and we started down what was going to be the Pan American Highway, but really? it wasn't finished. Yeah. And we had quite a time getting around because we came to places where they dynamited. Yeah. And uh, uh, at one point, they had to literally pick up my car and carry it across the hole that they just dynamited. Yeah. But uh, we got eventually down to Mexico City, yeah. and we made several side trips out from Mexico City. Uh, but we couldn't go many places because, like, going to Guadalajara was impossible. Right. You mean you couldn't get from Mexico City to Guadalajara? No, not by car. In 1935? No, Fascinating. no yeah. way. And uh, it was just a dirt track the yeah. cows would have used. Yeah. Anyway, one day we decided we wanted to go to Oaxaca, yeah. and there was no road to Oaxaca either, so yeah. we took the train. And somewhere about halfway between Wa uh, Oaxaca and Mexico City, I got off the train to buy some fruit in the railway station. And while I was buying the fruit, a very handsome Mexican came up to me, mm -hmm. and he looked at me and said in perfect English, uh, you're American, aren't you? And I looked at him, and I'd been to the Chicago Civic Opera many times, and I said, yes, and I know you're Jose Mojica, the opera singer and movie star, because I've, seen, I've heard you sing in Chicago with Mary yeah. Garden, and I've also seen some of your movies made in MGM in Hollywood. Yeah. And we talked briefly yeah. and went on, yeah. and we said goodbye, and that was that. Yeah. About six weeks later, we were leaving Mexico uh, in our Ford, trying to drive north through the central part of the country now, yeah. And we went to a bullfight in Carretero in honor of the new governor. Ah. And Jose Mojica was sitting in the governor's box. And that night we were walking around the plaza and ran into him. And we said, what in the world are you doing so far from Oaxaca? And he said, well, I'm on our way to see a town called San Miguel Allende, yeah. which I've never seen, but I'm looking for a place in Mexico where I can retire when I finish making movies mm -hmm. and where my mother can have a home because she's quite old now. Yeah. Well, he invited us to join him, but we didn't have time. We said, oh, sorry, we can't do it. Mm -hmm. We've got to continue on. And we bypassed San Miguel by way of Celaya mm -hmm. and went on north. Mm -hmm. Well, we did a book about the thing after we got home, and it was accepted for publication. Mm -hmm. came out in 1935 called Mexican Odyssey mm -hmm. and had a very nice success. The first edition sold out in 12 days, oh, and it had three, three more editions very quickly. And then in 1937, we wanted to come back to Mexico. Well, Jose Mojica, we had originally uh, gotten him back in 1935 to write a foreword to our first book, a very nice foreword, and uh, we'd never heard anything from him since, however. Mm -hmm. But this time I decided, well, I wonder if that man Mojica ever went down to a place called San Miguel Allende. We had no idea. Yeah. So I sat down to the typewriter and I wrote a letter, Jose Mojica, MGM, Hollywood, California. <laughs> and damned if I didn't get a letter back saying, uh, I'm out here and... Uh, why don't you come down and look over San Miguel Allende? Because I've got a home there now. Mm. And uh, uh, I think you'll find lots of material because it's right next to Dolores Hidalgo, uh, which is the birthplace of Mexican independence. When I arrived in San Miguel, it was like a stage setting. We came up the hill to, uh, from the station to the town, and uh, it was moonlight. As I said, it was 2, 2.30 in the morning. I was all alone. And everything looked white. The buildings were looked as though they were all white, whitewashed in the in the moonlight. And I arrived uh, in the center of town. There wasn't a soul, not a soul. It was like a deserted town. So we got on the train because there was still no way of getting to San Miguel otherwise. Mm -hmm. San Miguel was isolated completely. Mm -hmm. And we got off the train about 5 o'clock in the morning. We were the only two people getting off. Yeah. There was not a, another human being in the railway <laughs> station. And we wondered where we were because, of yeah. course, the town is not at the railway station. Yeah. Yeah. But at that moment, we heard a funny little tinkling bells. Yeah. And uh, down between the pirul trees came a funny little cart, a glass enclosed, drawn yeah. by three mules. Yeah. And that was the way you went up to San Miguel. They came down to meet every train. In this case, they just met us, uh -huh. and we got in this little cart, and they began, the mules began picking, <laughs> pulling us up the hill into San Miguel. Yes, well, there was nothing here. Of course, mm -hmm. I was the only American in town. Mm -hmm. There actually was one other man named uh, Mr. Beckman, mm -hmm. uh, who was a silversmith and oh. pit repaired watches, actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was married to a Mexican. He was mm -hmm. here uh, before I came, so I can't really claim to be absolutely the first American, mm -hmm. but uh, almost, you might say. I stayed at the Hotel San Miguel, which is now a, 
um, money exchange. It's right near our post office. And I knocked on this big, big, big door, big Sawan, and this, the door opened a crack, and this Indian with a sombrero pulled down over his eyes and the serapi over his nose. I could just feel, see a few slits <laughs> in his face, and that didn't help any. I mean, I didn't feel too good about that. <laughs> and then when they showed me to my room, that was even worse. <laughs> But primitive. it was very primitive. I mean, there were like five meter ceilings, and there was a an iron bed with a very an inch uh, <laughs> thick mattress, so on and so forth. It was sort of spooky. No bathroom. Mm -hmm. it, it was spooky. It really was. It was. But my friend Ward Crookshank, who was also a student, we were both on the GI Bill. And uh, he came and rescued me the next day and took me to the Casa Arias, which is now near where the Academia is on Masones above the, it was above the old market. And uh, quite a few of us students lived there. It was, a, it was a fun place to be. A Peruvian named Cosío del Pomar came to San Miguel. Oh, yeah. And uh, he asked me if I would join him in starting an art school. And he got a building over near the market uh, for the first year of the school, which was 1938. We just had a summer school running for two months. That's all mm -hmm. it was. Mm -hmm. And then the following year, he managed to talk to the governor. Mm -hmm. And uh, we got what is now Bayes Artis. And then for a good many years, we were there in Bayes Artis. Mm -hmm. And then in 1951, uh, Cosío del Pomar had gone left uh, San Miguel and gone back to his native country of Peru. Mm -hmm. But then he came back to San Miguel when he found that the Peruvian situation wasn't uh, satisfactory for, mm -hmm. for him and uh, joined hands with uh, Enrique Fernandez Martinez, the ex-governor of the oh, state. Yes. Mm -hmm. And between the two of them, they rebuilt uh, the Count of La Canal uh, I building. I so see. we closed the school we were running at the time up near the market. I see. Bellas Artes in those years was a ruin. It was a beautiful ruin. It, it, uh, it had a beautiful patio with trees and grass, and sometimes we would have deer in the middle of the patio, and Alfredo Campanella, the owner, would ride down from his ranch, the Atascadero, on horseback, dressed in his charro outfit with silver buttons and a big sombrero, and he was not a very large person. He was very short. And we always sort of giggled when we saw him. <laughs> and he would ride into Bellas Artes and tie his horse up in the patio. In, that, in those years, it was not run by the government. It, and it was just called Bellas Artes as fine arts, mm -hmm. a fine art school. And Sterling Dickinson, of course, was the director. Well, needless to say, I've seen a colossal amount of change here in San yeah. Miguel because yeah. when I came here, for instance, there was one taxi cab mm. which had uh, mm -hmm. air in three tires and sawdust in the fourth. The man <laughs> couldn't afford a fourth tire. So. We, we, of course, this is uh, rather a strange story, but right in the middle of the period of the 1940s, yeah. uh, the school was briefly sold to a Mexico City lawyer. Oh, the Instituto, uh, you mean? No, not the Instituto, oh, the, the original art school. Oh, Bayes Artists. Bayes Artists. Okay was sold uh, overnight uh, mm. to a Mexico City lawyer mm. whose record was not, not very, uh, mm. well, we won't go into that, but mm. anyway, uh, it was so difficult, I won't give you all the details, but it was so difficult to work with him that we finally were forced to go out and leave the school. We had 132 students, and in one day, 130 of us, with all the teachers, left the school and started uh, our own school over near the market with the help of the uh, Pala Secretary of Fine Arts in Mexico City. I see. And that made him very mad. Mm -hmm. So he went down to Mexico City and he bribed somebody in the uh, in Gobernacion to have us deported. We got to the border and we were still told we were going to get new papers. Yeah. Well, Leonard being B uh, for Brooks yeah. was the first person to go into the office there on the bridge, or just short of the bridge. And he went in. Pretty soon he came out all smiles. He said, well, I got my new papers, Sterling. And I said, Leonard, may I see him, please? I was pretty sure that couldn't be true. And, of course, he handed them to me, and right in the upper right-hand corner was in very large print, stamped, Deportado, <laughs> which... <laughs> he was a very, very interesting person, of course, later became 
the director of Bellas Artes. How about his archaeology? And discovered the mounds near Coleman Fort and discovered all of these wonderful artifacts, the pre-Columbian artifacts in which he had in his house. And of course, because of that, I really don't know the exact story, but because of his artifacts, he got very much involved in problems with the government because the government was cracking down on all the people who were trafficking in pre-Columbian art. Now, we never felt that Miguel did anything, Miguelito did anything wrong, okay. but the government claimed that he did. And he was a very sensitive person. He had a terrific reputation in town, and this devastated him. And it devastated him so that he he destroyed his collection and committed suicide. But I bought this place as a ruin, mm. and I just happened to look through the uh, door, which is half filled with adobes, one day when I was walking up, 10 days after I reached San Miguel back in 1937. Mm. I thought it looked very interesting. So I found out who the owner was, a little man, I think his name was Martinez, mm. and we negotiated, and the negotiation resulted in my buying this half of the property for $90, or 250 pesos. And, and people thought that you were out no, of the city? No, nobody said anything about that. That was all right. That was all right, was right. right with it. And I started work on it, fixing it up little by little. Yes. And then I decided I didn't want anybody buying the piece in front because it would be sort of unpleasant looking across the ravine at somebody else, like an old Mexican general yeah. or someone. So I asked about the piece of property in front, and I found out that that belonged to, I think it was Padre Mercadillo. Oh. And he wanted $130. Well, our telephone service, when we had it, was sort of amusing. It, in the beginning, it was a crank phone, <laughs> and it seemed like it was always a party line. <laughs> Everybody could hear your conversation. And you would call the central, and there was a woman, a very large woman, called Josefina. And you would say, uh, I, would, I would like the fronton. You wouldn't give a number. You would just say what you wanted. And she would tell you, well, your husband wasn't there. He had left to go someplace else. She knew everybody's business. <laughs> if you wanted to go to Mexico City, many people took, and we did several times, took the jalopy uh, car that started from the Bougainvillea Cafe, which was on the main Hardeen. Uh, and... Uh, how long did it take to get to, to Mexico City? And the, this jalopy had two little uh, jump seats, which were very uncomfortable. <laughs> and the uh, car had a great deal of difficulty getting over the high spots. When they got, they usually broke down when they got to San Juan del Rio. And uh, uh, the rest of the day, would be variously spent in efforts to get to Mexico. <laughs> so it would take at least a day to get there. And well, have to spend, you, sometimes spend you were lucky. Most of the time you would walk. And let me tell you, I walked up and down that hill sometimes three times a day. I shudder to think of it now. But I, I really did walk a lot. And we had about three taxi cabs, one of which could never get up the hill. He, try, he would try, he would start at the Jardin and, you know, get revved up and get up as far as maybe Nunez and then have to back up and try again. It was very amusing. But there were very, very, very few cars. What we had to go to Mexico City, though, was very nice and we could almost use it now. It was a limousine service. It was called a Turismo. Oh. And it, would hold, it was a limousine that would hold eight people and they would go in twice a day and come back twice oh, a day. Nice. So we could use that now. Yeah. And we even had a plane service for a short time uh, that would take people into Mexico City and that would do shopping for you. But you see, this was 45 years ahead of its time because there weren't that many people in San Miguel. There were only 8,000 people here. And I guess we're saying as those canny French said, the more things change, in a way, the more they remain the same. Uh -huh. So, put it together, Letitia. Heaven knows, it's a whole different world here, but in many ways, 
there's a resemblance to the beginning of people uh, being uh, interested in the arts and they're being lively, intelligent, mm -hmm. uh, people attracted to this little I Eden. I think so. And uh, that goes on so that this yes. new, new blood coming in all the time.